From the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This is the Bob Harrington Show. Dr. Robert Harrington is the Arthur L. Professor and Chair of Medicine at Stanford University. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. Hi, this is Bob Harrington from Stanford University on Medscape Cardiology and theheart.org. Thanks for joining us in these um, in these podcasts. We've been moving to a video format over the course of, uh, of the pandemic. Throughout the pandemic, we've talked about a lot of important issues facing cardiovascular medicine. We've talked about the science of COVID. We've talked about cardiovascular risk uh, amongst COVID patients. Uh, we've talked about a variety of things that affect more broadly, um, I'll call it healthcare and society, including the fact that COVID has really laid bare to us over the last few years. The issues of uh, vulnerable populations being most adversely affected by, by COVID. That really opens up the broader conversation about diversity, equity, inclusion in, uh, in medicine, and specifically in cardiovascular medicine. Cardiovascular medicine is not a diverse professional field, uh, but there's a lot of work underway by a variety of groups to try to address some of those issues. Maybe the group uh, that foremost is leading some of those issues around the workforce is the Association of Black Cardiologists, or the ABC. They've recently done work on and released the results of a diversity scorecard, uh, which is really grading institutions as to how well we're all doing with regard to diversifying our training programs. So we thought this would be a great time to bring in two leaders of uh, American cardiology and two leaders within the ABC to have this conversation with us. So it's really a privilege to be able to introduce two close friends and uh, close colleagues, uh, coincidentally, both here in the Bay Area with us. Um, first, to have this conversation, first up is uh, Dr. Michelle Albert. Uh, Michelle is the Walter A. Haas and Lucy Stern Endowed Chair in Cardiology. She is a professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. She is the director of the Nurture Center, a research oriented institute at, uh, at UCSF, and she is the Dean of Admissions. Michelle is the recent past president of the ABC, and she is the incoming or president-elect of the American Heart Association. So Michelle, Dr. Albert, thanks for joining us here on theheart.org. Thank you, Dr. Harrington, Bob. Um, it is indeed an honor to be here to discuss this really, really important uh, topic and the scorecard. We, we look forward to hearing uh, about it and also your views on it. Next up is uh, my good friend and colleague here at Stanford, uh, Dr. Eldrin Lewis. Eldrin is the Simon Sturzer Professor of Medicine and the Chief of the Cardiovascular Medicine Division here at Stanford University. Eldrin is also the Chair of the Research Committee at the Association of Black Cardiologists. Eldrin, thanks for joining us here on theheart.org. Thank you so much, Bob, and I'm really excited uh, to be a part of this as well. Thank you for inviting me. Before we jump into the topic at hand, which is really to focus on the scorecard and what that means and what you found and what we can all do about it, uh, Michelle, let's start with you. And let's can, can you frame for the audience the importance of thinking about a diverse workforce as we think about clinical care, education, research, all the things that, um, that academic medical centers really should be focused on? Thanks, Bob. It, it's it's critically important now more than ever, um, given as you highlighted with the uh, disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color, um, especially African-American, Hispanic-American, and Native American communities, as well as lower socioeconomic uh, status communities, um, that we have a diverse workforce that addresses the unmet needs. Um, we've certainly seen improvements in uh, technology and in drug therapy, uh, clinical trials over the last three decades. Um, but the effects of those uh, improvements in cardiovascular medicine have not translated into um, light decreases in life expectancy and improvement um, in disability um, for especially communities of color, specifically black communities and Hispanic communities. Um, why is this the case? Um, this is in part the case um, because um, we don't have the workforce 
um, that can actually really communicate effectively with those communities and also design research and clinical trials um, that actually uh, incorporate elements um, that are important for addressing uh, the disparities. We also don't have diversity um, in clinical trial participants. We don't have diversity in, in investigators. And this investigator part um, is particularly important as we think about um, the, uh, the workforce. You know, as dean of admissions of, of uh, UCSF School of Medicine, I, I know that despite over the last 30 years, um, there has been actually a decrease um, in the number of uh, Hispanics, for example, uh, sorry, Native Americans, 30% decrease in the number of Native Americans applying to medical school. Um, the increase in African Americans has only gone up by like 1.2%. Um, and, uh, and, and this is despite an increase in applications to medical school in general. And that's at the medical school level. That's not talking about the deep pipeline that actually feeds into medical school, which is so critically important. And then this all has a reverberating effect um, to residency, to cardiovascular fellowship, uh, not being able to have the clinicians and the researchers um, who can actually bond and gain trust um, from the communities that need to be in clinical trials that then um, relate to um, what we see in terms of disparities in healthcare. Um, so from the ABC perspective, the ABC has been an organization that's been in existence for 50 years and actually was founded on the principle of uh, taking care of and focusing on the needs of a diverse America, especially of African Americans. And so uh, during my presidency, which took place in these last two years, um, it was really important um, from a strategic standpoint um, for uh, me to usher in um, programs that focused on workforce. Very nicely giving us the overview, Michelle, of the importance of this. Eldrin, you're a cardiology chief. That means you're um, helping select trainees for fellowship spots, postdoctoral uh, research spots. You're also hiring faculty at all levels, assistant professors up through professors. Let, let's start with how do you think about the workforce? It's sort of like you've got to assemble a team. And, um, and how do you think philosophically about assembling that team? What are you thinking about in terms of the kind of fellows you want, the kind of postdoctoral research, uh, uh, postdoctoral graduates that you want, who are you looking for? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Bob. And I would echo, first of all, echo what Michelle has said about the importance of the pipeline, and then just um, add that I'm actually looking for excellence. So excellent across the board. And that excellence is in clinical care delivery, in uh, advocacy uh, for our patients, but also to help uh, in the, you know, in the national landscape with uh, policy development, uh, research, um, and, um, and really kind of uh, meeting patients where they are. So part of that is kind of meeting the, uh, the diverse needs of our patients. There are many patients who really want uh, doctors who look like them, um, and they want to, uh, to have a better understanding of how we can kind of use those similar cultural backgrounds um, and apply it uh, to trying to change behavior uh, for secondary prevention and primary prevention and even primordial prevention efforts. Um, but with this, we realized that uh, one of the best ways to recruit a diverse workforce uh, with regards to scientists and cardiologists will be to actually develop the workforce yourself. So it's so important to have uh, not only a wide variety to choose from uh, with regards to people who've already completed their internal medicine residency and they're applying to fellowship, um, but to also have uh, a diversity of interest. So just because someone comes from a racial, you know, from underrepresented racial or ethnic group doesn't necessarily mean that they're interested in doing disparities research, which is it's so important. We, we want basic scientists, uh, you know, translational scientists, population scientists, uh, addressing what they want. Um, and so my job and my role as uh, chief of cardiovascular medicine is to ensure that whatever the interests are will be met uh, and that uh, there will be a fertile environment for, for them to get the training. Part of that training is to actually get um, a good cadre of mentors and uh, a mentorship team um, who can not only mentor but sponsor. 
so that we can shepherd people through the process. And what better way of doing that by really working hard to have a very diverse uh, fellowship program and then actually provide them with the tools necessary to not only understand what they want to accomplish in their academic and their clinical career, um, but also to provide the, uh, the ability for them themselves to become uh, the future mentors across the, uh, the spectrum of people who are in the training pipeline. Michelle Aldrin said something that I think is, uh, I, I want to highlight because I think it's so important. He said that patients sometimes, maybe even all the time, um, they like to engage with clinicians that look like them. And there's some important work that's been done in things like the barbershop studies, uh, that when you have uh, a community of caregivers who, in fact, reflect the community, uh, the care is better. Do you, want, do you want to touch upon that? Because we're, we're not just saying that this is a good thing to do. This is evidence-based. No, and I, I think that's really, really important. And there's several things there that I want to touch on around that issue. Uh, so the first is, is that we know um, that, you know, just for, as a personal a anecdote, I'll say, you know, many patients will um, reach out to the cardiovascular clinic at UCSF and say, hey, you know, I want to see uh, Dr. Albert. And then when I see meet with them, they specifically chose me um, because I happen to be African-American and I happen to be an African-American woman. And they feel that this is going to offer them the opportunity to be able to express um, their lived experience in a way um, that they feel that they have not been able to. And usually they're very grateful thereafter. So just from a personal perspective, I think that, you know, I, I know that and that's my been my lived experience. Now, moving to the evidence-based aspect of this, we know um, that studies like, for example, there was a study that was done in Florida um, looking at uh, babies um, born and the the, the racial concordance of the babies born with the providers and uh, the outcomes um, related to uh, the perinatal outcomes for those babies. And the perinatal outcomes um, were improved um, for those um, babies who had clinical concordance um, with uh, the provider. And this is not the, 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 the mother, this is the, the, the child. Um, and it, similarly, I think the barbershop study that you mentioned um, is very important in that regard because it, it, it brings in a social determinant of health, brings in uh, uh, another part of the healthcare team, pharmacists, um, and it meets people where they are. Right. Um, and all of those elements put together um, really engender um, more trust, um, more uptake and adherence of uh, recommendations. Um, so this this concordance um, or certainly competence or understanding how discrimination is baked into um, our medical systems and structure um, is important uh, to understand as we you know, have therapeutic relationships with patients. This doesn't mean that our wide swath of our beautiful spectrum of race and ethnicity in the world, um, that, you know, you can't take care of a, a person of color if you're not a person of color. Um, it's really, you know, sort of um, understanding that um, the issue of uh, diversity is important. Um, and Eldrin mentioned diversity in thought, as well as, you know, sort of diversity as it relates to lived experience. Um, so I, I, I think those things are all important. The other thing that Eldrin touched on that I wanted to pivot back on too as well is, you know, when we're recruiting for fellowship or for um, the medical school, you know, one of the things I say in the opening when I'm talking to the applicants is, look, you know, we are looking for doctors um, who are, again, going to address the most pressing issues that face us over time. We can't anticipate what those are. We know what some of those are right now. And what that then means is that we need to recruit people who are going to be exceptional across the spectrum of medicine. Yeah, what I particularly like that both of you brought up is this issue of trust. And there's a, uh, a deep literature now um, that's very much in favor of this notion that trust is such an important part of uh, of the clinician patient relationship, and people do better when they trust who it is that's taking care of them. We have data that supports that. Elder, now let's get to um, the ABC work in this area. One, uh, certainly, one of the things that ABC is interested in is diversifying the workforce and the cardiology workforce. 
Yes, it starts in a very early pipeline. I always love the pictures of Quinn Capers um, doing uh, white coat ceremonies for kindergartners in Columbus, Ohio. Um, but that's not what you're doing, Eldrin. You're picking cardiology fellows. And um, the ABC has started to quantify how we're all doing as institutions, those of us that have training programs. Talk to us about the project, and then maybe Michelle can give us the at least an insight into some of the data, including, you know, let's put both the UCSF and the Stanford data out there um, and uh, and talk about it. So go ahead, Elder. Why don't you tell us the genesis of the project? I know absolutely, and I would love uh, Michelle's commentary uh, as well. I, I think I think it really is to kind of look at a snapshot and say, where are we? And understanding that this is a snapshot year over year, and it certainly can change, especially when you have relatively small numbers. Um, but the concept is, if you don't look at something, then you won't necessarily know when there needs to be a change and when we need to emphasize it. So um, the example that I would use, I would bring up disparities research again. Um, so for decades, we've said, OK, there are disparities, racial uh, disparities, uh, gender or uh, sex disparities, um, and it's characterized. However, um, what we don't do uh, enough is to emphasize here are the things that we can do to change. So these are the things that work. These are the things that don't. So if you don't characterize it, then you don't kind of uh, look for it. So, so if you, uh, with this scorecard, uh, for those who, uh, those institutions that have uh, a 20% or higher kind of representation um, from a racially uh, ethnic uh, group uh, for among the fellows, uh, for basically, uh, Black, uh, African-American, Hispanic, or Latinx, et cetera, uh, would be in the green category. Then you would have the yellow category for 10 to 19 percent, and uh, less than 10 percent would be in the in the red. And I would I would say, you know, when we, when this data came out, uh, Michelle and I are very close friends, and um, and it, it hurt me uh, that we were in the 10 to 19 percent. Um, and uh, and I know that if we were to look today, we we would be in the green, but it was a snapshot at the time. Uh, so what it means is we need to really be purposeful and recruiting is not something that we can just say, we'll just recruit uh, agnostically. We have to look specifically at uh, who the makeup of the, of the fellowship program will be. And uh, the example that I would use uh, that doesn't I didn't include race is if I were to look at all of our seven fellows coming in and all seven wanted to become interventional cardiologists, basic scientists. I would say, okay, I need to make sure I find a place for all seven uh, people who are coming in. So you want to look for diversity of interest. Um, but also, I think it's really important to be to, to be a truly vibrant uh, kind of uh, fellowship training program. You want to make sure that you have diversity across all, all uh, lenses, both racial and ethnic diversity, as well as uh, gender or, or sex-based uh, diversity. So I'm really excited for what we've done and the fact that uh, for the next iterations, we will be in the group. Not that you're competitive, Eldra. <laughs> Not um, at all. So, Michelle, give us the snapshot of the U.S. when the ABC released these results recently, for example. Yeah, so I want to backtrack a little bit about the, uh, the scorecard. The scorecard is called the Association of Black Cardiologists Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging Scorecard, the ABC DIB scorecard. And there was a 10-member um, a committee um, that actually worked um, to pull this together. And it is actually a, a new spin on an older version of this that the ABC did um, about 15, 20 years ago um, when, um, for example, there was an institution that um, had never recruited any African-Americans um, to their program since their um, inception. Um, and what it resulted in was that that institution became one of the most diverse institutions across uh, the U.S. Um, so the importance of, you know, sort of really, um, you know, putting something out there so that people can see it and it acts as a, a real motivator. Because we all know that there are problems in programs, um, but it doesn't mean necessarily that programs will make an effort to do it. The other point I want to make about the scorecard is that it actually was really difficult to actually garner the information um, to put together on the scorecard um, because we contacted 20, uh, 42 programs based on um, the top 20 programs in the U.S. and other geographically um, uh, appropriate, you know, to, and also to get geographic diversity. 
And it took a lot of effort um, to actually get this information. And the official sources from which you can get this information actually um, said they would give the information, 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 and we never really got it. Okay, so we ultimately got information from 29 programs, mostly from program directors. And I think this is a very important part of this discussion um, because um, this is how we perpetuate structural uh, discrimination and racism if we're not able to actually put our laundry out there. And what was nice about what Eldrin just said is that he knew that he knows where Stanford um, is on this list, um, but you know, using it as a growth opportunity, as a growth mindset, I think is really important. So I, I really needed to say that part. And I think the other part I need to say, and, and Bob, I may have even forgotten your question by now, but um, the scorecard was intended to capture the number of black and Hispanic trainees and faculty um, across uh, the programs that I already mentioned, um, as well as the um, the level of the faculty, because the faculty become an important part of this too. We have not published the faculty data yet. We're going to do that in the next rendition. Um, and I, I think it's also important to actually highlight which programs were in the t in the, in the green. Um, I, I'm hoping that you're going to put it on your Medscape um, program, but Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital, Boston Medical Center, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Duke University, Hospital University of Pennsylvania, Mass General Hospital, Morehouse School of Medicine, which is a predominantly historically um, black college and university, uh, uh, UCSF, my home institution, um, University of Florida, Jacksonville, University of, Mich uh, of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and Vanderbilt University Medical Center. I think it's important to state that and put that in the program because those programs need to be commended. Um, and then the programs who are in transition, um, you know, the, this is not a shaming document. Um, this is just, a, I, actually, I want to congratulate all the programs who actually submitted data because being vulnerable enough to submit data really means that you really care about this issue. Right. So to be in the red, OK, in this document, it's important that, you know, you're in the red, but also you put yourself out there and make yourself vulnerable that you're in the red um, is also um, something that we are very appreciative of at the Association of Black Cardiologists. You did answer my question. And um, and thank you for listing the sites that are in the green. Um, and I think getting back to Eldrin's point. These are outstanding cardiovascular medicine training programs, no matter how you look at it. And so it's fantastic that they're committed not, you know, to this aspect of excellence along with uh, with other measures of excellence. And I would agree with both of you, which I think you're implying is that similar to quality improvement work, you first have to measure things and then you have to report on it and then you have to come up with a plan of action. And I know that um, I just really enjoyed how you stated that, Michelle. This is an opportunity for all of us that lead uh, residency programs, fellowship programs to get better at what we do. As we move into our last few minutes, I want to give each of you a minute or so to say, what else can we do to make cardiology a welcoming place for people of all backgrounds? Cardiology is, Michelle, one of the things I know Michelle talks about a lot is the intersectionality of things like being Black and a woman. Um, and so let's, you know, let's put it out there. Cardiology's been working hard at trying to increase the number of women in cardiology. We're working hard to uh, increase the number of black cardiologists, Hispanic cardiologists um, from other underrepresented groups. Eldrin, what can we do in addition to measuring, reporting, and getting us consciously thinking about this? Give me a tangible, a tangible example of what we can do. And then I'm going to ask you the same question, Michelle. Absolutely. I, I think we have to break down the misperceptions. So if you ask, and, I, and I'll, I'm not going to just focus on uh, uh, racial and ethnic uh, uh, diversity, but also gender diversity. When we're looking at 15% of the workforce in cardiology being, being women, a lot of times when I talk to medical students and try to encourage them to go into cardiology, they're like, uh, I don't like the work-life balance. And I often will say it really comes down, there are so many things to do within cardiology. So the misperception that it's hard, you know, that it's not, a, it's not an area where I can, can thrive. I think that has to be broken down. And I think the second, and the reason it's so important to have such a diverse workforce is there's nothing better than to look at someone 
who has a similar background, a similar upbringing, and say, I've done it. Let me tell you how life is, and let me tell you how I got to my point, to, to where I am now. So uh, in addition to breaking down the misperceptions, we have to move upstream. So that includes um, undergrad, really high school, and we've done high school programs, um, certainly medical school to continue to say, this is how you can become a clinician, a clinician scientist, a clinician educator. Here are the many paths, the you know, diverse uh, fabric um, of kind of how to be a cardiologist and how to succeed. You know, I love the, uh, the, the example you give, uh, Eldon, I talk about the personal narrative can really make a difference. Uh, um, and you and I have participated in some of those AHA high school programs where you meet these amazing young kids. And then you're asking yourself, how can we pull them into cardiology with us? So the, the personal story, I think, goes a long way. Michelle, what's your example? What can we do? What tangible advice do you want to give the, to, the, uh, to the audience? Yeah, so I think a few, I a few items. Um, first, I think grounded in the principle that we all belong to the human race. And that we all um, hope for the best um, for you know our neighbors, our friends, etc. And you know, if you think of a neighbor or a friend who is of a different background to you, I'm sure you wouldn't want anything to happen to them, and you want a workforce that can take care of them. So, in that light, starting from that grounding, I think one one of the things that we need to do is to actually transform our educational and uh, and training modules. Right now, medicine is becoming um, more diverse. Um, both 50% uh, of our medical students are women, for example, um, and certainly um, at some medical schools, um, the uh, UIM percentage um, is upwards of uh, 30 to 50%. What that means then is that the culture of medicine has to change and evolve um, to be in parallel um, with what the needs are for those students um, and trainees. Um, and that's something that we have to do in terms of cleaning our house. Um, and that also gets to deal with that intersectionality issue that you mentioned, Bob, um, because, you know, as you know, medicine has been traditionally white and male, right? And if trad medicine is traditionally white and male and many white men now are concerned that, oh, we're talking about all this diversity and inclusion, et cetera, what about me? Um, that speaks to um, those persons rolling up their sleeves um, and, um, joining um, the transformational movement that's occurring um, in medicine. Um, and that's a really, really important thing. Um, and then I think finally, um, there has to be leaders have to be judged on their mentorship and sponsorship. So one of the things that's really fantastic about you, Bob, is that you um, have made it part of your, um, your life commitment to sponsoring UIM and sponsoring women. Right. Um, we need more leaders um, like you. Um, so those are some examples um, that I would say are really, really important to the future, not just of about diversity, but it actually is about the, the future of um, medicine. You're, you're way too kind to me and um, we'll edit that piece out. But I will say that uh, that I do think you're both spot on that mentorship, sponsorship, allyship critically important and the call out there to all leaders to uh, make that part of your own personal scorecard. I want to thank the two of you, Dr. Michelle Albert, Dr. Eldrin Lewis from UCSF and Stanford, respectively. Um, the work that you're doing is incredibly important for all of us as we aim to, uh, to really diversify and make even more excellent our cardiovascular workforce. Um, this has been a terrific conversation. Kudos to the ABC for um, taking this on, which is hard work, as, uh, as you've both indicated. Uh, we've been talking about diversity scorecards and cardiovascular medicine training programs, and, uh, and really thanking both of you again for your leadership and the ABC for its, uh, its really forward thinking and uh, in doing this sort of work. So thanks for listening to us. This is Bob Harrington on Medscape Cardiology and the heart.org.